This is Canada News Libre. Okay, great. Um, uh, what, I, what I'd like to do uh, this morning is uh, give you an overview of um, some aspects of cancer in general, and then more specifically brain cancer, and show how we are able to uh, uh, manipulate energy metabolism in the, in the body uh, and in the brain uh, to target uh, uh, cancers. As I said, I, 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 we can work on any kind of a tumor, but uh, I'll specifically be speaking about brain tumors uh, today. Um, first, uh, I put here a provocative question. If for those of you who are in the cancer field, uh, you will know that the National Cancer Institute uh, on their website has put 24 provocative questions. These questions are thought to um, uh, direct uh, cancer research for the remain for the, throughout this century, and um, uh, stimulate various kinds of approaches and new insights into the disease. However, you will not see this provocative question on the 24 question list, mainly because uh, most people in the cancer field um, have have already uh, determined that cancer is a genetic disease. Um, the question is is uh, uh, is that is that true or not? Now, uh, what, what I have done is uh, reviewed over 50 years of research from a variety of perspectives uh, on the nature of uh, the role of, of, of the nucleus and the mitochondria in the, in, in the progression of, uh, and origin of this disease. Now, this, these studies, I, I, put, I put this very simple diagram to distill down uh, quite a number of articles uh, uh, that go back to the 1940s. Um, all the way up to present day uh, um, uh, investigations. And uh, basically, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, this might, I know we had, oh, maybe here's another one here. Um, let's see if this, oh, there it is. Okay, so what I've done here is I've shown, here's a, a normal cell uh, in green, a tumor cell in red, uh, what I've shown is a normal nucleus and cristae in the mitochondria, um, and we know normal cells beget normal cells. And, and when we look at the cancer cell in red, we have a dysmorphic nucleus, and we have mitochondria that are, have absent cristae to signal to indicate that we have defects in both the nucleus and, and mitochondria in the cancer cell, and cancer cells beget cancer cells. There have been a number of studies where uh, nuclei have been transferred. These are in animal and human tumors. Uh, Nuclei can be transferred from one cell to another. And when the nucleus of the cancer cell is trans transferred to the cytoplasm of either an oocyte or a very early uh, stem cell, uh, what you get are, are normal cells, sometimes normal tissues, and sometimes complete organisms from the nucleus of a cancer cell. Now, what happens, depending on the number of mutations, will determine how far in development that organism goes before it aborts. So the mutations that are associated with cancer don't cause cancer, they abort development. Now, if you take the nucleus from the normal cell and put it into the cytoplasm of a cancer cell, you either get dead cells or tumor cells. You don't get normal cells. What, what these findings indicate is that, is that it's, uh, 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 the mitochondria can suppress tumorigenesis and that, and that uh, mutations, uh, whatever they happen to be or how they're related, are not the drivers of this disease, regardless of what you might read. Now, if cancer is not a genetic disease, what kind of a disease is it? And Otto Warburg, many years ago, who did the most of the work, we've heard some uh, preliminary speakers about this, all cancer arises from damage to cellular respiration. Glucose fermentation gradually compensates, compensates for inefficient respiration. Uh, respiratory damage eventually becomes irreversible. And cancer cells continue to ferment. Uh, and, and he was primarily talking about glucose. We have expanded this now to include glutamine fermentation. Tumor cells can ferment not only carbohydrates, but they can also ferment some amino acids, in particular glutamine. So this is another, I'm not gonna have a chance to talk about that, but if we don't target glutamine, we won't get a complete management of the disease. Although targeting glucose will certainly be very effective. 
Now we know that at metabolism, um, most of the energy coming from the cells uh, will be coming through oxidative phosphorylation. We get small amounts of energy through glucose fermentation, and we can also get energy through the Krebs cycle. Cancer cells have damaged the oxidative phosphorylation, thereby having, ha having to need compensatory energy source through fermentation. Glucose fermentation goes way up in many cancers, and also glutamine fermentation can go up. So these two sources of energy can compensate for the loss of oxphos. So when we look at mitochondria of tumor cells, this is a normal electron micrograph. You can see the cristae loaded. The cristae contain the proteins of the electron transport chain, which, are, which generate most of the energy in our bodies. But uh, you can see here, this is a, a, a mitochondria of a glioblastoma multiforme, a brain tumor. You can see it's crystallosis. There's many examples. I've gone through in my book many, many. Uh, we never find completely normal mitochondria in any tumor cell. And there's no way that these tumor cells are going to be able to produce energy through oxphos if they don't have the structures needed to do this. Now, what I've done here is just summarize the entire cancer field in this simple diagram that my students and I, uh, we, we worked on this for about five years. You can get the students will, so that they can help us build this whole thing. Uh, cancer is a metabolic mitochondrial disease caused by multiple different things in the environment damaging respiration. This then leads to a retrograde signaling system. The mitochondria signal to the nucleus. We, are, we, we don't have enough energy. The nucleus then turns on oncogenes. The oncogenes are compensatory. They're transcription factors that drive fermentations, both glucose and glutamine fermentations. But if the cells continue to ferment, the nucleus becomes unstable. So you get genomic instability as a secondary downstream epiphenomena of damage to respiration. So oxphos is gradually replaced by substrate level phosphorylation. Unfortunately, I won't have a chance to talk about advanced cancers, which are basically a macrophage disease. Macrophages use tremendous amounts of glutamine and glucose. So you really have to target to manage metastatic advanced cancer. You have to target both metabolites. Anyway, you can get the entire spectrum of the Hanahan Weinberg uh, characteristics following this. I like to talk now a little bit about brain cancer and, and specifically. A highly, these are highly invasive and vascularized tumors, generally poor prognosis. Incidence may be increasing through cell phone use, but this is only for those individuals that might be susceptible to this. Mo unfortunately, most therapies for brain cancer are ineffective in managing the disease. Two major categories, we have the primary and the secondary brain tumors. Glioblastoma is a primary brain tumor, one of the worst, very, low prog very poor survival after five years. This is a childhood uh, cerebellar tumor, medulloblastoma. About 22.5%, 22.5% of all cancer deaths uh, come from metastasis, that is the movement of cancer cells from some other organ to the brain. Now, we have used calorie restriction, restricted ketogenic diets, and these kinds of uh, approaches as a metabolic approach to cancer management. Now, calorie restriction involves a total dietary restriction. It differs from starvation in that calorie restriction can maintain adequate levels of minerals and nutrients. Calorie restriction, uh, if it's done the right way and, in the, and looking at the correct biomarkers, will enhance mitochondrial biogenesis and increase uh, efficiency of oxidative phosphorylation. It's important to recognize that calorie restriction in the mouse mimics therapeutic water-only fasting in humans. So everything you see about all the stuff that I'll talk about calorie restriction, how do humans do that? You have to stop eating, do a therapeutic fast. So this is because the basal metabolic rate of the mouse is seven times that of the human. So the biomarkers for calorie restriction are reduced blood glucose and elevated ketone bodies. Let me get this, I must hit the wrong. So we know the brain uses glucose exclusively However, through an evolutionary conserved uh, adaptation to low glucose, we mobilize fats. This is, again, related to hormone changes, insulin and glucagon and things like this. And the three major ketone bodies are beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate. Acetone is a non-enzymatic degradation product of acetoacetate. So the brain will then transition gradually over to ketone use as an alternative to glucose to subserve energy needs for that organ. Other organs will use ketones as well in fatty acids. When we look at the energy problems in brain cancer, in fact, most cancers for that matter, we have, well, in, in the brain specifically, glucose is the primary fuel. It enters through transporters, goes into the, uh, it goes through the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway to pyruvate. Pyruvate in normal cells would be fully oxidized in the TCA cycle. Because all the mitochondrial problems in brain tumors and other tumors, pyruvate then is, is, is uh, fermented to lactate. Lactate goes back into the circulation, goes to the liver, be converted back to glucose through the Cori cycle. It comes back. This is this vicious cycle we just heard about uh, and some other components of that. Calorie restriction. 
will lower blood glucose levels naturally. You can bring those blood sugars down, carbohydrates or ketone bodies will then enter into the brain and then uh, the, the problem is, is the cancer cells, we and others have shown that the tumor cells cannot metabolize the ketone bodies for energy. So what happens then is they be their main source of fuel, glucose. Not only that, the normal cells upregulate glucose transporters, putting additional metabolic pressure on these cancer cells. They can't use the fuel that the normal cells are using. They become metabolically marginalized. Now, to show you, uh, we've done a lot of work in mice uh, on, on calorie restriction. This shows ad libitum ale is an uh, unrestricted mouse fed ad libitum. This is a 40% calorie restriction over about 12 days, starting three days after tumor implantation, you can clearly see we can get uh, reductions anywhere from 65 to 90 percent reduction, depending upon uh, how we do this. The important thing is what are the, what are the, what's going on inside the tumor cells? What, what's, we've shown that this is powerfully anti-angiogenic. Blood vessels are significantly reduced in these tumors. You know, you hear about all the anti-genic therapies. There's nothing more powerful than calorie restriction in reducing the vascularization of the tumor. It's also pro-apoptotic. It kills the tumor cells through uh, programmed cell death mechanisms, and we've shown, uh, we've shown that. So you can see the tunnel positive. These are the dead cells uh, uh, in, in ad libitum-fed cancer. You don't see as many as you do in the calorie-restricted tumors. We've done linear regression analysis to ask, you know, what, is the, what are the drivers for this whole thing? And uh, glucose, as glucose levels go down, each one of these is a, uh, is a mouse under a different uh, dietary condition. Ketones go up. This is an evolutionary conserved adaptation. As glucose down, tumor, gluc goes down, tumor weight goes down. The size of the tumors shrink for the reasons that I've said. We've also seen a correlation between glucose and IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, which is a driver of tumor angiogenesis. As glucose goes down, IGF-1 goes down, and the corresponding signaling cascades associated with that uh, hormone go down. Uh, we've just recently shown how calorie restriction can target the most problematic aspect of cancer's inflammation, which is NF-kappa-B. Uh, calorie restriction knocks down phosphorylated NF-kappa-B through Cox mechanisms. It shuts down the entire inflammatory system that's going on, that's driving and uh, contributing to the progression of the disease. So can calories, now the other thing is as well, in cancer, especially brain cancer, you have these terribly invasive tumor cells. They don't just grow as a lump in the brain, they actually spread through the brain. We, we've developed a, a natural mouse model uh, uh, for gl human glioblastoma multiforme, and we're able to test a, a number of therapies on this new mouse model that we developed. It's one of the only mice models, mouse models that reflect the entire spectrum of what you see in the human disease. And this shows you here, this is the tumor growing in an ad libitum-fed uh, mouse. Here's the hippocampus. These tumor cells will, will invade right through the entire brain. They'll move from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. And you can quantitate that using bio bioluminescent imaging, as we've done. But you can see in the calorie-restricted guys that the, 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 the borders of the tumor become much sharper. They, they don't invade as much. And we've shown how you can, they reduce invasion significantly, the calorie-restricted diet, which is linked to low glucose and elevated ketones. Another question is, does, can we get therapeutic synergy when we combine a glycolysis inhibitor uh, together with a restricted ketogenic diet? We've heard already about ketogenic diets. Um, the diets... It doesn't, in this case, we're looking at a standard mouse chow diet, which is actually like a standard American diet, high in carbs, low in fat, and you've seen the whole thing here. Uh, any kind of a ketogenic diet will work. We've looked at various, this is a keto cow, but we've looked at lard base, we've looked at other base diets. This is a low carbohydrate, high fat, moderate protein, uh, produces a fat to protein carb ratio of four to one, as opposed to less than one for the high carb diet. Uh, 2-deoxyglucose is a non-metabolizable analog of glucose. So what, what happens is a substitution here for hy hydrogen for a uh, hydroxyl group. This molecule enters into the, the cells. In fact, it's like fluorodeoxyglucose. It can go into the cells, but it can be, not be used for metabolism through glyco uh, uh, glycogen to make glycogen or through glycolysis. So it kind of uh, 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 inhibits the, the, the energy metabolism. So we've done a preliminary study in mice um, showing, now this is a standard diet, high carb diet, unrestricted, a body weight control. And then we gave the animals 2-deoxyglucose at a dosage that had no therapeutic benefit. I wanted to use a dose that you could say, well, he's, they've got 2-deoxyglucose, but it's not having any effect. And the body weights were the same. Now we, we give the ketogenic diet in restricted amounts because we've shown if you don't restrict the ketogenic diet, it has no therapeutic benefit. So we calorie restrict the ketogenic diet to lower blood sugars and elevate ketones even further. 
And then we added the 2-deoxyglucose, and now we got powerful synergy between a diet and, 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 the, and the drug. And, and basically what happens here is under the fed state, you have a lot of glucose molecules going around. Glucose is the sole fuel for the, nor for the tumor cells, which will drive their progression. Also, normal cells will use the glucose. However, when you go into the restricted diet, glucose levels go down and ketones go up. The normal cells now uh, uh, take in the ketones, which the, the tumor cells can't use the ketones. Not only that, receptors for glucose actually go up in the normal cells, putting additional metabolic pressure on the tumor cells. You throw in a little 2-deoxyglucose, which now will more specifically target the tumor cells to give you a synergistic interaction between the ketogenic diet restricted and drugs. This is an emerging field. We've just started this. There are many other metabolites out there that we can use together with these diets to kill off these tumor cells, and, and also targeting their glut uh, glutamine metabolism, which I won't have time to talk about. So the clinical question, can the ketogenic diet re uh, um, uh, be used to... Uh, manage brain cancer in humans. You know, you can do all, I'm, I'm finished doing the mouse stuff, forget it. We're just, we, you know, we, uh, there's a hundred studies out there on mice and cancer, forget it. We gotta go to the patients now. We have proved this is, works in the mouse and it will work in humans. And, and we already heard from the first study, Lyndon Nebling's study back, uh, Case Western Reserve, uh, with, a, with a diet that lowered glucose and elevated ketones, she was able to get um, uh, longer term management for two children with uh, inoperable brain tumor. We published the second paper uh, on a patient uh, from Italy uh, using uh, therapeutic fasting ketogenic diets together, unfortunately, with the standard of care. You can't get away from it. It's a terrible thing. It's responsible for the demise of most of the can brain cancer patients are dying from the standard of care. Now, this patient uh, had classic histological evidence for glioblastoma, high cell density, palisading cells. Um, the radio, this is the radiographic image before any treatment. Uh, you can see multicentric. This is an MRI image. Uh, glioblastoma, we confirmed that histologically. The patient did receive the standard of care. Following the standard of care, the patient then uh, was on a therapeutic fast for three days, uh, then on a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet for several months. Now, we had radiological resolution, which very rarely happens when using just radiation and chemo, temozolomide. So we had a, a, a really quite remarkable response. We had two more MRIs, both look clean. The patient then gets off the ketogenic diet, and about two months later, uh, tumor recurrence. Rather than going back on the diet, the patient chose to go on Avastin, uh, which we now know in, enhances the invasive properties of the tumor cells. Terrible drug, never, never recommend it. Anyway, it, it selects for the most invasive cells, and unfortunately, the patient expired. The, the issue here, of course, is that Will this therapy work? Uh, and the answer is, uh, uh, this proves the cons. Yes, we can, we can, we can Im greatly improve this. Uh, as long as we can get glucose elevations and ketones, uh, ketone elevation, you can get, uh, 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 put the tumor in a defensive state, and then once it's in this defensive state, we then go after the tumor with specific drugs to put additional pressure uh, on, the, um, uh, on the cells. So we have preclinical and case report studies indicate that this restricted ketogenic diet can be an effective metabolic therapy for managing malignant brain cancer in children and adults. And the therapeutic effects of the diet against brain cancer can be enhanced when we combine it with specific non-toxic drugs that work together with the diet to, to target the surviving tumor cells. Now, uh, I put all this out in a recent book. It just came out from Wiley Press discusses this and many other therapeutic, non-toxic therapeutic options for managing cancer, not just brain cancer. And I thank my collaborators that have worked with me on this and many of my students in my cancer class have, that have been very uh, uh, helpful on this. Thank you for your attention. Because, I, uh, because I'm running this, I'm, I'm going to ask the only question. Uh, are you c currently taking patients? Um, I, I'm not a physician. So uh, what I've done is I've, I collaborate with physicians, and we're trying to get a pilot trial going at the University of Pittsburgh. Our biggest problem is uh, uh, IRB, Institutional Review, Review Board. Uh, they, they just put so many pressures. 
I mean, this is not a toxic therapy, yet they, they treat it as if, oh my God, all these patients are going to get sick. Uh, um, uh, we're trying to get a pilot study. There's another pilot study at, at Michigan State University. I, I wrote the protocols for both of these, of the, both of these uh, approaches. It's just very hard to get through IRBs, the Institutional Review Board. Once that happens, I think there'll be a lot more, uh, a lot more use for this. Well, all right, we'll take okay. you. Um, this is more of a clarification, but um, you talked about standard of care being the main cause for demise of cancer patients. Can you just um, say what that is, what that includes? Yes. Um, standard of care for brain cancer involves radiation and timazolamide. Okay, as soon as you irradiate the brain, you, you damage, you release a lot of inflammatory cytokines. You allow glutamate to go into the microenvironment. The glutamate is then taken up by glial cells and converted to glutamine. Because the neurons have been killed, the glutamine now goes into the tumor cells and is fermented along with the tumor cells. To reduce the inflammation, they give ster steroids. Steroids make your blood sugar go up to the level of a diabetic. So what you have now is you have powerful glucose and you have powerful glutamine, and together they will fuel the tumor. This is the demise of the cancer patient. The reason why we have so few people surviving is because of the standard of care. It has to be changed. If it's not changed, there will be no major progress. Thank you. Period. Thank you.